Thank you so much, um, Joe and Hawaii Aries, for inviting me to give this presentation. I'm really excited um, about talking with all of you about Arden Mesh and how we use it at Aries LAX. A uh, little bit about myself. My name is Oliver Dooley. My call sign is Kilo 6, Oscar Lima, India, and I'm the District Emergency Coordinator for Aries LAX Northeast District. And that's my email at the bottom. If you have any questions afterwards or you want to reach out, please feel free to do so. Um, Aries LAX is unique in many aspects in the United States. We're the only section that is confined to a single county. And there are about 10 million people living in LA County, so it's a big order. What we do is hospital support. We support the 70 plus hospitals in the in LA County um, with backup communications should that ever become necessary. And so Arden Mesh is one of the components that we use. And I'll talk to you a little bit about this. This is kind of a overview over what Mesh is and how to get started. There's a lot more to this. This is usually two or three presentations. That, uh, that is how we've done it in the past, but I wanna give you an idea of what we're talking about here. All right, let's get started. First, we're going to talk about what is Arden Mesh. Second, why do we use Arden Mesh? And then finally, how we use it. I'll give you a couple of use cases and how people can get started. Um, we do use Arden Mesh extensively at Aries LAX. Arden stands for the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. And it is an incredible, incredibly powerful tool in the amateur radio um, world. Let's start with what is Arden Mesh? What is a mesh altogether? It doesn't have to be Arden, but any type of mesh. Essentially, a mesh is a network of self-organizing and self-configuring nodes. And that means there isn't a centralized organizing force like a server, a central server or a router, a single router that takes care of all the addressing and all the traffic. Every node creates a map of all the other nodes it can see both directly through RF and indirectly through all the other nodes it's connected to. It also calculates how costly it would be to send packets of data to any node on the mesh network that it can see. The advantage of having a network of self-organizing and self-configuring nodes, of course, is that it's very robust. If any part of the network goes down, let's say in this example, node four lost its direct connection to all the other nodes except for node three, it can still contact all the other nodes um, on the network, including node five. It'll have to go through one of the other paths, but essentially the node itself does the calculation of how to get the traffic there. And that's what makes it so powerful and fun to use. Essentially think about it as a very large local area network. It contains whoever registered these, and I have to look that up, whoever registered the IP addresses for amateur radio in the 70s was a genius because he registered all the class A for the 10 dot um, IP addresses. So that's a, millions of addresses that can be used for this. Network topology. Let's talk a little bit about how you would set this up and what the typical um, frequencies are that we're using. At the base of it are the local mesh islands. That's local usage endpoint nodes, that's users like you and myself who are just setting up our kits, our go kits in most cases, and connecting to other nodes. Most of the time we use 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz nodes for that. And the links are between zero and three mile links. And zero miles means literally you can create a mesh with five, six people just sitting around connected to mesh nodes and you can pass IP based traffic. Next are relay nodes. Those tend to be on high buildings or mid-sized um, mountaintops, towers, and so on. Tend to be between three and 10 miles. Practice is to use 5.8 gigahertz for most of these nodes. And I'll become apparent on the next slide why that is. And then finally, they're the backbone nodes. Those are usually at repeater sites, high mountaintops, 
and cover 10 to 30 mile links. Um, one of our operators is actually connected from Sierra Madre in the foothills of the San Gabriels all the way to Pleasant's Peak, which is uh, last time I calculated a 38 mile hop and it uses 3.4 gigahertz. Right now, 3.4 gigahertz is extremely quiet because amateur radio it used to be a radar. Um, my understanding is it used to be a radar frequency that has fallen in disuse. So amateur radio is pretty much the only thing on there that's about to change sometime next year. We'll see whether that's a good thing or bad thing. Just be aware of that. But if you have 3.4 gigahertz, it's extremely quiet and extremely fast because there's no noise. Frequencies, essentially there are four bands on UHF and SHF, super high frequencies available. 900 megahertz is possible, but there's hardly any equipment out there for it. And it's in SoCal, it's practically never used. The big three for us are 2.4, <coughs> excuse me, 2.4 gigahertz. Um, as you can see in the top line here, and I got this information from ardenmesh.org, so you can always look it up there. And you can see there are two non-shared channels. What do we mean by non-shared channels? Essentially, when you flash a node, you're expanding the range of frequencies that it can use. Normally, when you use your phone or your router or any Wi-Fi device, you can use channels one, two, three, four, five, six, and beyond that because those have been assigned by the manufacturers. But what the Arden programmers have done is they've taken these frequencies that amateur radio operators have access to and they've added them to the nodes. This is what really makes it very, very useful because as you can imagine, minus one, minus two, and all the non-shared channels are much quieter than any of the other channels that you have to share the spectrum on which means higher throughput rates, easier connects, and so on. So that's 2.4 gigahertz, the two channels. 2.4 usually used on a local basis around a campus, for instance, to connect various nodes to the next higher level node. On 3.4 gigahertz, and I've already alluded to that, there are 24 non-share channels right now. Um, the downside of that is, and it's 3.4 gigahertz, not the more popular 3.8, um, so you have to watch out when you buy equipment. The downside is there isn't a lot of equipment available for that. You can purchase it. And if you do purchase it domestically, you actually have to send the company that sells it to you proof that you are a licensed radio amateur. So they will not sell it to anybody who isn't a licensed radio amateur unless it's for export. And of course, it's very quiet. We use it for long hops and links. 5.8 gigahertz is the workhorse. We all have 5.8 gigahertz nodes around um, because that's what connects us to the next higher node, usually on top, in our case, on top of a hospital on a mountaintop where there's area coverage. And you can see from 166 to 184, it gets a lot quieter because those are in the handband. Just keep in mind that from 165 to 170 roughly, there are wireless internet service providers that are using those frequencies, WISPs. And so sometimes when you co-locate on towers, there can be interference. So it's better to actually stick to the ham bands exclusively or to find a very quiet channel within your area. And again, the, let me say this up front, the guys who came up with Arden, they're pure geniuses because they actually include in the software itself a scanner. So you can scan the information, you can scan and see what channels are available within that bandwidth. Very, very powerful. There's a difference that we make in terms of what we want the networks to look like and what the purpose is. And the two main types are ad hoc and infrastructure networks. An ad hoc mesh, essentially when we refer to that, we mean a mesh network set up to support a specific mission usually temporarily. So you come in with 10, 15 people, you set up a network in an area, let's say a disaster area, or an area where you have a need for IP services, set it up, and then after you're done with your mission, you break it back down and you bring it back with you. Something that we use very often. Examples are the Baker to Vegas relay race, the AC100, recently the Great Shakeout. 
any type of disaster deployment usually falls into the ad hoc mesh category. Then there's infrastructure mesh, which is mesh networks that support the day-to-day -day amateur radio practice and operations. And those are usually um, off of mountaintops. There's wide area coverage and people can hook into these networks and talk with people, do voice over IP, do pretty much anything you can do on an IP network. And we'll talk about that in a moment as well. This is a picture from about three weeks ago. This, is a, this was a live screenshot. And you can see that for yourself on the website ocmesh.org. They do have a live map on there. And these were all the infrastructure connections within SoCal. And there are a couple of things I would like to um, point out. One, Ventura County has had a very strong, to, to our west, has had a very strong mesh presence for a long time. And they've been very leading in this. Same for Orange County, which is where some of the programmers live. And San Diego County is coming online fast. But take a look at Palm Springs um, on the far right or to the east of the, the screen here. Palm Springs, up until February this year, had no mesh to speak of. And then their local radio club got together with a PAPA system, which is a large repeater system, and they just exploded onto the map. Literally, within about eight weeks, they had a very robust mesh setup. They got up and running very, very quickly. They have weekly nets now every Monday night that you can log into, and it's, it's quite fascinating to see how quickly they've brought this online. Now, of course, for Palm Springs, it makes a whole lot of sense because as you can see to in the bottom right-hand corner, that's the Salton Sea. And every major event that people are afraid of um, in the San Andreas Fall usually starts rippling out. The models usually start at the Salton Sea. So they do have a need for this kind of um, presence. Ad hoc mesh concept. And this is something that we use a lot in Aries, LAX Northeast. Essentially what you do is you build a local mesh island with the group that you're working with, let's say at a hospital, and you can pass traffic from the EOC to let's say your radio site. Then you connect to the neighboring mesh island, which could be another hospital or a infrastructure site, if for whatever reason that has survived or a temporary site set up. And then one island connects to the infrastructure if there still is an infrastructure. The goal here is to have high quality links above all else. A lot of hams tend to think about it in terms of distance, how far can I go? In mesh networking, it's usually faster if you have a lot of short hops that are all high quality links than to have one long hop where you only have a link quality of 50, 60%. So keep that in mind as we're talking about this because in, in your case, this is very similar, actually living on separ uh, separate islands. And why do we do that? It optimizes circuit capacity. We want to move as much traffic as possible over the given bandwidth. We minimize interference that way by only having one station connect instead of five different islands connecting to the same station and having to share that bandwidth. You actually connect to the next island and then send your traffic all through that chain. That actually makes for much less interference and much greater capacity. And it also stabilizes the network. If any part goes down, you can usually pop up another node in another part and that can make up for that connection. And we've done that. So essentially that's what it looks like. You start with a mesh island, you connect it to another mesh island, to a third mesh island that then has an infrastructure node. And that in some ways is also how we've done it at the Baker to Vegas relay race. I'll show you what that looked like in terms of pictures. By the way, if any one of these nodes, it doesn't have to be an infrastructure node, if any one of these nodes, let's say here, has an internet connection, it can actually provide limited speed, obviously, but it can provide an internet connection to all the other nodes. And that is what really turned us on to mesh with our hospitals, because if we can mesh our hospitals before an event, if the internet goes down, if communications are severed, then we have the possibility of dropping in a single cell on wheel or a cell on a light truck and actually provide services to temporarily for all the hospitals involved. Mesh is not a substitute for your home internet. People ask that, but it's one, not designed to do that. 
two, because the bandwidth is shared, it's not a good idea to do that. Um, plus three, most internet services like Gmail, Netflix, and whatever we consume is encrypted, meaning it's not compatible with amateur radio um, practice. Keep that in mind, encryption is always an issue. So why do we use Arden Mesh? The challenge for Aries LAX is our traffic is logistical, which means we send hospital status assessments, which is a bed count and you know what, what the status level is of that hospital, can it actually take patients? Mass ca uh, casualty incident polls, which we've seen lately tick up a little bit, not typical traffic, it's something more the fire department does. Resource requests, of course, are a big one in terms of logistics. And of course, all the hospital incident command and incident command forms make an appearance along with other traffic that you may not be able to predict. So our primary objective is always accuracy and our secondary objective is speed. We will sacrifice speed for accuracy any day, but if we can have both, why wouldn't we want to do both? And digital tends to be both accurate and fast. Let me give you an example. This is about the first half of a crash card of a hospital crash card and here are medications and that's the first drawer out of eight plus the top plus the bottom and every hospital has usually between 20 to 40 depending on the size of these around if we had to send this with morse code that wouldn't work if we had to do this with itu phonetics and had to spell atropine to somebody that would take forever so going digital is a big deal for us and it makes our life substantially easier plus the hospital gets to generate the data exactly the way they want, and we just pass it along, which also reduces the error rates. Mesh in our world doesn't replace anything. It adds to our capabilities. And this is our concept of operational flexibility. Generally, in our world, most people will start out and be in the center here with VHF, UHF for two reasons. A lot of groups start on the HF side. We tend to start on the VHF, UHF side because that means everybody who's got a technician class license or higher can participate. VHF is medium bandwidth, medium distance. You can go up to 100, 120 miles. You can use WinLink, which is email over radio. You can use NBeams, which is messaging. You can do voice with FM and single sideband. Works really well. The equipment isn't very expensive and it's very easy to install and it usually fits um, both in our cars and in our homes and more importantly our go kits. The next thing we usually add then is mesh which is high bandwidth and short distance. It's strict line of sight. Please keep that in mind. If you can't see the node you won't be able to actually hit it. Um, Usually you can get it through about one tree, but then you're dropping down to like a mile, mile and a half, two miles of distance. And the same node without that tree can go 15, 16 miles. So keep that in mind. You can still use WinLink. You can do voice over IP for anything voice plus all the other IP based services. And then finally adding HF gives you low bandwidth, but it gives you long distance. You don't have to see the other station in order to connect. You can still use WinLink and NBeams. You can do voice, especially on single sideband. So it gives you these options. And at the, at the center of this is the operator. The radio operator makes the decision on both what are his capabilities and skills are and what the situation calls for. That's a really important concept. Plus, if you do have internet available, we do encourage you to use that first and foremost. But by and large, it gives us a whole lot of flexibility. Here's a multi-mode approach um, in data, and you're welcome to look at this later on. Essentially what we already talked about, one of the keys I would like to point out is here in the digital realm, WinLink is acro available across all of these modes and makes it really, really easy. So if you get one thing from this talk today, get a WinLink account and start practicing with it. It's very, very powerful. Um, another thing I would like to point out is the cost. Mesh equipment is extremely low cost compared to everything else. VHF, UHF rigs, a good one runs between $300 and $500. 
a good HF rig is usually between 700 and upwards and no limits, but 700 and $1,500. That's kind of the sweet spot there. Mesh equipment starts at 20 bucks and the high end equipment will cost you $150. So it's not very expensive. So emergency communications in our world is multi-mode and cross band. And we do consider flexibility a great strength of amateur radio. Two minute speed comparison, I think that's good to keep in mind. In two minutes, you can transfer 10 kilobytes on packet, 60 kilobytes on VARA, VARA FM, which is a new mode, by the way, with very similar encoding as your Wi-Fi nodes or your mesh nodes in that case. And you can transfer 150 megabytes on mesh at 20 megabits per second. So there's a massive difference there. 10 kilobytes is generally a text file, a simple text file or comma, comma separated file. 60 kilobytes, now you're talking Word documents without a whole, a whole lot of pictures or small images. So that's absolutely doable, especially if you know a little bit about images, you can actually get some really high quality images at 100, uh, at 60 kilobytes. But obviously 150,000 kilobytes is a lot of data to move in a short time. But that all depends on you having line of sight on mesh. If you don't have that, then you're back to using VHF, UHF. Surf agencies benefit, usually benefit very greatly from that. One, it's familiar technology. One of the things we found in talking to our fire departments, in our case, the hospitals, they really like the fact that this is technology they deal with every single day. One of the tests we had at a local hospital, which is one of our hubs, Huntington Memorial Hospital is a level two trauma center. They had a nighttime exercise and we set up a mesh for them. And we thought video would be a big selling point, right? You see what's going on. We were far enough back so you couldn't see, identify any faces. So the HIPAA issue didn't come up. But by and large, what we found is doctors, nurses, and administrators, they weren't really interested in, in seeing the triage area because they know what a triage area looks like. They've all experienced it. What they were really interested in were the phones, the voice over IP phones. Once they realized I can just pick up, I can dial this IP number, doesn't even have to be a centralized IP, a centralized network. I can talk to those people and tell them what I need or they can tell me what they need. They were really, really sold on this. They really liked that. Email, of course, everybody's using, and video, if you need that. By and large, I, I think the biggest users of video would be fire departments. Um, water and power tends to be very um, video heavy. We found that with Monterey Park, they like that a lot. Any type of file sharing people are familiar with, that makes it much easier to get their jobs done. That's what this is all about. It's a really high return on investment because the equipment is really low cost. Um, one fire department asked us to do a proposal and what it would cost to buy enough equipment to cover seven sites. And when we gave them the proposal, they came back and said, no, no, we want the professional equipment. And we said, that is the professional equipment. I said, but it's still a third of the price of a single one of our handheld radios. I said, yep, that is, this isn't expensive equipment. And the power consumption is very low, which means you get to operate longer. And that's of course, in an emergency, something that you never want to run out of power because if you run out of power, you can't help people. Something to keep in mind. You have a lot of flexible deployment options as we've alluded to, and I'll show you with the use cases. So you can quickly adapt to the needs of a disruption. Just keep in mind, and that's a big caveat, bring that up whenever I, you want to set this up. There's no encryption in amateur radio. And that means any amateur radio, including these networks. So we recommend, highly recommend to air gap all mesh networks from agency networks. They never should be on the inside of the network. All of our networks, when we bring them, the closest we get to the hospital networks is the guest network for internet access. But other than that, we never put anything or connect anything to a hospital computer or any of the other agencies that we work with, that's just not a good policy. Keep these networks separate. If there is the type of disaster where you have to 
use an IP level network like this, you can have it and you can just plug it in. It'll work beautifully with pretty much all your IP based systems, but I wouldn't do that unless I absolutely ha had to. What you can do is for instance, you can practice with this and I'll show you what we did with ShakeOut in a little bit. How do we use Arden Mesh? This is actually a photo taken from one of our deployments at Baker to Vegas. And this is Jeff W2JCL. And that was his entire setup for mesh. And it worked absolutely beautifully. As you can see on top, he's got a camera pointed towards the runners. On the right is a mesh node pointed back towards our infrastructure node that we put up temporarily. And he's running all of this in a relatively small power case at the bottom. You can see that. And that worked absolutely fantastically. And you can see he's got this, can you hear me now post? Because he's making a phone call on voice over IP on our local mesh. Mesh nodes, there are four large sources of mesh nodes right now. Ubiquiti, which for a long time was the only um, company that could be flashed. Um, great equipment, high quality equipment. On the top left here, you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see the Nanostation M5 has about 16 dB gain and uh, works really well. And it's kind of unique. It has two Ethernet ports. So you could actually hook in, uh, you can either daisy chain another mesh node to it, or you can hook in a camera or your computer, et cetera, et cetera. Then the nano beams next to it, pretty high gain and a couple of dishes. The one on the right here is called a rocket. And as you can see, the radio is at the bottom here and it has two very short jumpers to the antenna. It can be hooked up to a variety of antennas. It could be a dish. In this case, it's an omni antenna. It's a sec you can hook it up to a sector antenna and it's usually very popular for mountaintop sites. One of the reasons or one of the things I get asked a lot about is where's the antenna with this radio and where's the radio? Usually they're almost, if they're not on the same board, then they're very close, like you can see here with a rocket. Because the losses on, the cable losses on the gigahertz frequencies is so high, you do not want to go longer than just four or five inches if you can avoid it. So please keep that in mind. So RJ, RJ8, um, 100 feet, that just wouldn't work. Microtech is a Latvian company that has come online in the mesh world in a big way in the last couple of months. Most of this wasn't available a year ago, but they're fantastic quality. They're less expensive. Um, they're very popular all over the world. A little bit harder to flash than the others, but once you get the hang of it, they're brilliant. Um, we really like the HAP AC Lite which is a router, it's a two gigahertz node and it also gives you part 15 access. So your cell phone can connect to it, your Mac Book Pro that doesn't come with an ethernet port can connect to it wirelessly and can be on the mesh. It's a big game changer in our world. Then they have these um, SXTs, small, uh, small units, great for Go, um, for Go kits, 16 dBi gain. And then you have these large dishes that come in 24 and a half and I think 28 um, gain, dB gain. And then if you have a dish network antenna lying around, you can actually use an LDF and that plugs into your dish and makes that into a high gain antenna. It's really nice, especially if you live in an HOA restricted area. Next up is the GLINet. <clears throat> and those are almost all two gigahertz units and we use them for local deployments to train and you know I have one hooked up to my gateway which then connects to my half and which is then connected to the internet it's super easy to use and TP link they're popular with some people at um, repeater sites we generally don't recommend them because everything here goes roughly from 10 volts to about 28 volts so we can use our 12 volt batteries that hams have all over the place to run most of this equipment as long as the ethernet cables aren't too long. But these, the TP-Link, 
go down to only to 16 volts. So you actually have to have a step up to run them um, effectively. Do recommend step ups if you're going to have long ethernet runs, but before you buy anything, I would strongly recommend that you go to the artmesh.org support a platform matrix. Most of the time you can actually click on these links and I'll take you to the precise note that you want. Some of these notes look similar to equipment that cannot be flashed. You do not want to be in a situation where you're trying to flash something and it's not supported. So check that out first before you get into this. IP equipment, what can you connect? Anything that connects to IPs. We connect cameras to it, computers, including Raspberry Pis and all the services they run. And our phones, one of the things that is a bit, that is always a concern during, it was a concern during the fires we had last year and the year before and during an earthquake most definitely is most of our cell phones will be bricked within the first two, three hours because how many of these cell towers will survive? Well, mesh is one way you can actually unbrick cell phones for a small group of people that actually need that access. So that's a really, really powerful way because then again, you're using familiar technology. How do you get on mesh? Here's a simplified process. I'm not saying it's a simple process, but it's a simplified process here. You flash the node, then you set the node name, the password, channel, bandwidth, and the distance. Although the newer versions, you don't even have to do that anymore. So save it, reboot, and point it to another node that has been flashed. Make sure you're both on the same channel and bandwidth. That's really important because they won't connect otherwise. And that's it, and you can connect. And next time you take them out of the box, provided they're still on the same channel and bandwidth, they'll just connect the second you boot them up. Ubiquity MicroTik TP-Link and GLINet flash processes differ immensely. Here's just a rough outline that I use whenever I flash one of these. Essentially, the important part to remember here is for Ubiquity, you essentially Telnet into the node and then you upload the firmware. That's really, really easy once you've done that two, three times. MicroTik is a little bit more involved. You certainly have to go through a number of steps in order to get this working. Most importantly, you have to turn off the firewalls. It certainly doesn't like any firewalls involved. Um, you do have to use something called Tiny Pixie. You have to make some small modifications. There's actually a YouTube video on that and how to do that. But once they're flashed, they're brilliant devices. Highly recommend the MicroTik as well. And the GLINet, we wish all of them were like that. It's literally drag and drop. Arden is built on top of OpenWRT. So chances are, if you have an OpenWRT router that you'd like to use, there's a good chance that it'll actually work with Arden as well. But Let's not dwell on this for too long. This is something that you would use practically and you have to do a couple of times. We highly recommend doing a flash mob, getting people into a room and flashing it together with two, three people, maybe more that have done this before. That cuts down on the frustration level dramatically. Here's a basic crossband configuration for mobile. And this is what we recommend people start with. Start with a Microtech HAP AC Lite. It's $45 on Amazon right now. Um, you can probably find it for five, six dollars less some other place um, if you shop around. The nice thing about those is they have a 2.4 gigahertz node built in for local mesh after they're flashed. And you still can use the 5.8 gigahertz for the part 15 access for your iPhone, your Samsung phone that you couldn't flash. Plus, they have a PoE in and they have a PoE out, meaning you can actually plug another node into it and do what is called device to device linking. And now you have a 5.8 Arden node that you can use for the distance connection, which makes it very, very powerful as a tool. And so you can, with that little node, if you have two of those, you can connect two separate mesh islands. Very powerful. And the cost of this is, sorry, I didn't line up, but um, $106 for that package. The SXT is around $58 when I checked last and the HA, AC light 45 to 48 dollars um, usually it goes up um, Tron K6 MHI who is my better half really likes um, that the scientist in her likes to experiment with these things and so she put together her own go kits 
and she actually outlined the process on how to connect them and what to pay attention to. And if Joe wants to, I'm happy to give you that PDF and you can use it as a starting point. It's not a must, like you have to have all these bits and pieces. It just shows how they're interconnected and what the options are because it can be very overwhelming. Here are a couple of resources. Um, I'm happy to give you the slides later on and send them to you. Ardenmesh.org has a fantastic forum. People are super happy to help. You can search the forum, makes it really easy. And unlike many other amateur radio endeavors, they actually have a very good documentation. So you can go to the documentation, can pretty much find the answer to any question you might have. So I highly recommend that. It's ardenmesh.readthedocs.io and you can find it on the Ardenmesh website too. OC Mesh, Don puts that out. It's a great website to get started and understand what's going on in the mesh world. And then for RF mapping, generally a couple of good ones are radio mobile coverage. And that's the online version here and Radio Fresnel point to point. This is great if you need to figure out two sites, can they actually connect before you, you know, brave the elements. Use cases. And ultimately, this is all about services. What we're trying to do with amateur radio service is to deliver services to our surf agencies. Example, Baker to Vegas relay race. It's a race that's been happening for 35, 36 years and quite a long time. Essentially, last year, about 2019, I should say, this year, 283 law enforcement teams are running a relay race from Baker in California all the way to Las Vegas in Nevada. Um, there are about 20 runners per team because again, it's a relay race at 20 stages. And every runner is followed by a follow car and a team that supports them. It's, it's a big endeavor. So about 8,000 people come to each and every one of these stages. It's quite, quite the event. So it's a small town right there. Um, interestingly enough, 2019, the winners were Belize National Police for the first time, um, followed by the LAPD and followed by the LA Sheriff's Department. As you can see, those times, it came down to seconds. Um, it was close race. Our group is right here in the center, stage nine at Chicago Valley. And we actually used MESH for two years now very successfully. There's a quote from Mike Blampy at USGS that Chicago Valley is a place where beauty meets severity. It's most definitely true. That picture at the bottom there was actually shot by one of our operators from the com tent. And you can see, I keep joking that Chicago Valley is not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. So it is, there is no electricity, no power, no water, nothing. If you didn't bring it, you won't have it. And that's what makes it a great case to actually practice and test our abilities. The challenge for us with mesh was it's strict line of sight. We had to get around this major range here in the center of this mountain. And so we decided to shoot the signal all across to that little hill here staying on this side because the back side here is all national preserve. So staying on this side where the road is still, um, what's still considered part of the road all the way to in the far, you can see the, you can see the stage. This is not a long distance, but the conditions made it challenging. Essentially, we use 220. This is what we do on voice. That's how we tell the station, the stage that the runners just passed mile out. We use 70 centimeters for the talking and two meters for the PA, but mesh was new to us two years ago and we wanted to get a video feed. So we connected mile out via our mesh joint to 200 meters out and to the stage. So everybody had really good situational awareness throughout the entire race. The other thing that happened there is we had access to a Verizon cell on wheel, which is also shortly um, called a cow lovingly. So we were actually able to use that cell on wheel, which had a connection by a, a geosynchronous satellite to the internet to actually tunnel our mesh back into the SoCal mesh. And that of course made 
gave us access to everything that was on the SoCal mesh in addition to giving us access to the internet. So we could make phone calls to other people on the mesh all over Southern California. That was really powerful. We had live video, voice over IP, we used WinLink, and we used our mobile phones via mesh. So essentially what we did in terms of design for this particular network, we had a centralized joint that everybody pointed to, and that may may not have been the best connection because there were a limited number of nodes. We decided to go with an omnidirectional. If you have more nodes, you do want to start segmenting your area because that actually will increase the throughput. If you have a 10 megabit connection, let's say, and you've got 10 people hooked in, everybody only gets one megabit. If you have 100, that gets cut down even more so. So at that point, you actually have a benefit to doing a cross-band repeater or cross-channel repeater. So early warning, that's Jeff W2JCL again. Um, Tron K6 NHI at 200, uh, 200 meters out, early warning. Stage nine, the center communications tent had access to that directly. And of course, we were meshed in through the cow. Originally, we thought we could do it via the comms tent, but for whatever reason, that didn't happen. So we actually managed to get a little, a very tiny part 15 router to wirelessly connect to the Verizon cow over a 600 foot diff, uh, distance. That was really fun and turned out to be a very good experiment and very practical. This was our mobile mesh setup at 200 meters. And you can see all of this fits in a box, so it's highly portable. And we believe that smaller boxes that can run for a long time are a better way to go than bringing a whole shack in a box because you may have to close up and move. I mean, you live in volcano country, Probably a good idea if you can move your equipment relatively quickly. In our case, with earthquakes as well. So I, um, you're no strangers to earthquakes as well. Being able to stay flexible is a big benefit. Um, on the right here, you can see a beautiful view of the Chicago Valley in the back and the stage and the Nopa Valley range in the back. So we did have a really good view from um, our little site up there. These were mesh team photos, so essentially selfies. Um, on the left here, we have Robert, K6YZF. On the right, on, on his right, is Jeff, W2JCL. And these were pictures we took over the mesh. And then Tron, K6NHI, and myself. And of course, Robert and Jeff chose to take a selfie through his IP camera too. I want to point your attention for a moment here at the bottom, whoops, bottom right of that selfie to the right of Jeff, the date says 2018-0101. That was because the IP camera does not have a, does not have a battery in it. So whenever you hook it up, it looks for the time. And if there's no internet connection, it cannot update the time. However, when we connect it to the cow, at mile out because they were connected through the mesh. Now look at the picture here of the runner coming in the bottom right hand corner. It says 2019, 323, and it gives you the exact time. Because we added that internet connection, all of our systems updated that were connected to the mesh, including our phones. That was something that really blew our minds because we were thinking, how useful would that be if you're in a dire situation and you have people connect to, let's say, a single HAP locally in that mesh island that then is connected to another mesh island that then is connected to a cow or another internet connection and everybody at least can use the equipment they used to very powerful so these are some runners um, coming through and you can see you can actually read the bib numbers here that's how good the, the picture quality was and this was a 40 dollar camera um, we got off amazon and there's a follow car right there um, we kept the picture on the top right because it looks very artsy. We're looking for a, gal a gallery who would actually um, buy and sell this, but you know, so far, no luck. But this was a whole lot of fun. And this is going on. The shift is usually 10 to 11 hours, depending on when they start. So it was a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work out there. And you can read more about this particular, how we did that the first year around in our Art and Mesh Tunnel article. 
in QST of February 2019, page 78 and 70 to 80, I think it is. Or you can download it from the South Pasadena Amateur Radio Club website. QST was nice enough to give us permission to upload it to that. But it's a good story. All right. So that was Baker to Vegas. Very powerful in terms of what we learned there. And we've been applying this all across. The 2019 AC100, the Angeles Crest 100 Ultra Race, is one of the five original ultra races. We start as a coffee conversation. Could we put up a mesh? Because in the desert, relatively easy, you don't have any trees. But once you are in the Angeles National Forest, it's a forest. Now you have a lot of trees. How do you get around that? So let me talk to you a little bit about the AC100 and what it does. It's 100 miles to the Angeles National Forest in August. The elevation gain is 21,810 feet. The elevation loss, and for those of you who do regular hiking, going downhill is always a lot harder than going uphill. It's 26,480 feet. And the altitude range is from 1,100 feet roughly to 9,300 feet. So you have to be very fit to do this. And surprisingly, the fastest guy who does these 100 miles um, this year did it in 19 hours and 39 minutes. My head is off to him. Um, great job. Amateur Radio is there to provide voice and packet via runner track. So we track the runners where they are at any given point in time. And if they don't check in, we actually have a place to start looking for them. And there has been some IP networking, but Arden was new in 2019. As far as we know, nobody has done Arden before. So the challenges for us were terrain, mountains with trees. Would there be an internet connection? Because that's how we would connect to the home database. And we had to be flexible because the weather might change. You are in the mountains in August. And there's some people who said, well, it would never work. But the solutions were surprising. One was hike the mesh joint, the main part of the, that that'll make it work up a mountaintop. And Russ KS6MLU and Tom KN6BKT actually did that. They hiked it up to Mount Lewis at around 8,100 feet elevation and set up mesh nodes up there. And Tom KN6BKT stayed up there for, he hiked up in the morning at 4.30 and we brought him back down at around 6.30. So he was there all day tending the station, making sure everything's working as it turned out. Um, everything was working fine. Towards the end, one of the batteries died and he had the system back up and running in no time. The internet connection here wasn't provided by a cow because we didn't have a cow, but as it turned out, AT&T had a hotspot up there. Um, not a hotspot, but the hotspot would connect to the AT&T network. So that worked absolutely brilliantly. And we were able to switch our plans from a simple local mesh with video to a mesh that actually connected the four stations and allowed them to send the runner track traffic over the mesh. And mesh saved the day that day because on our stage, two of the packet stations failed, which was very unlikely to happen, but they both had issues, uh, separate issues. And we managed to do everything via mesh and it really, really, uh, made a big difference because instead of sending 200 entries that had locked, that we had locked, that had to go all over our packet, and for those of you who've done packet, that takes a long time, it literally took less than two seconds to send those 200 entries and update the database. Very powerful. Um, the other, Baker to Vegas isn't a long distance, but here you're talking about six miles from, as the crow flies from Cloudburst on the left to Mount Lewis, where the mesh joint was, all the way to Vincent Gap, that's another two and a half miles. And they were all meshed really, really well. And the other two stations, Eagles Roost and Islip Saddle, could have connected to Mount Lewis as well. Um, for reasons of their own management, they, they chose not to, but this worked really, really well for us. And again, at Mount Lewis, we had a cell phone connection that then provided data to all the stations. Very powerful. This was our team at Cloudburst. On the right here, on the far right, is Russ, KS6MLU. And to the left of him in the turquoise um, shirt is Tom, KN6BKT, who kind of initiated the whole process and managed it and did a phenomenal job. 
but as you can see, it only took us three, four people to do this. So it is a very powerful multiplier, force multiplier, if you will. And here's a view from Cloudburst, and you can see in the distance, that's Mount Lewis. And you can see all the trees. We're able to just shoot right through the trees on Mount Lewis as well. 2019 shakeout with the Monterey Park Fire Department. The fire department actually approached us and said, well, we'd like for shakeout, we'd like to try out what would happen in a big incident. So we have a lot of trained certs and Monterey Park, I should mention this right now before we move on, is one of the most forward thinking fire departments I have ever had the pleasure of working with. Um, they're extremely aware of the environment they operate in and they're trying to address issues before they arise. So we said we're happy to help, at least, you know, try it out. The goal was to set up at a park, a Sequoia Park, and then set, have them send out the certs to do actual damage assessments. And they had to go to the different addresses and write down damage assessments and take pictures and bring back and get that information from the park to the EOC. As it turned out, Sequoia Park has a wonderful old tree that happens to be right in front where the mesh nodes would have been the best. So that turned out to be our major challenge. We couldn't put the mesh node on top of the tower that the city has up there, which would have put us above the tree. But the tree actually, we could see the mesh node a little bit from the EOC, but we couldn't really make the connection solidly. So we had to think about it in kind of a roundabout way. So on the left here, you see Sequoia Park. Right to the right of that, you see the EOC. And that connection, because of the local topography and that tree, was almost impossible to get working reliably. So what we did, we actually shot the signal up to the far left up there. That's actually JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And from there, it went to Huntington Hospital. From Huntington, it went up to Mount Wilson. And from Mount Wilson, back to the EOC. And the beauty of that was we now had a couple of options. The system stayed up the entire time, worked beautifully. We had a strong connection, about 20 megabits per second. So it was a good, fast connection, even though we had to go through all these hops. And we we're able to send video, live video of the park to the EOC. We were able to send emails instantaneously. We chose for the voice part. We did make voice over IP calls, but it turned out to be much easier to use the push to talk on our handhelds, our two meter handhelds. And we were able to pass traffic the entire time, everything they brought. So on top here, on top of the fire department was the five gigahertz node pointed towards Mount Wilson. And we pointed our node from the EOC to that five gigahertz node on the same channel on very low power. So not to desense that or overpower that um, rooftop antenna. And on the left here, you see the room that we worked in. That's Mike KM6KAQ. And in the center here is Chief Mark Heil, who has been an absolute fantastic chief to work with very forward thinking, has a lot of great ideas, and was, his guidance was extremely valuable in the process. And as you can see with Mike here on the left, he actually has the Node webpage up on his computer, and he's got one link in the back, so it's very powerful. And on the right, you see this was towards the middle of the day when a lot of the certs had returned, and this was the mobile setup. None of this was connected to any generators or or grid power, it was all run on solar. So this is the setup that they had up at Sequoia Park. You can see all the portable stations, two meter 440 rigs, as well as um, mesh nodes. And this picture was one of those selfies again taken. And again, in the bottom right here, you can see they have the time, which indicates that there was an internet connection somewhere in the network. But they passed that traffic really quickly and efficiently, and they even sent pictures of the damaged buildings. So that worked really, really well. Made the Monterey Park emergency coordinators and the city manager, in addition to the fire department, very happy. And Monterey Park has a history 
with earthquakes. One of the, the one of the Department of Water and Power officials came in and was looking at this, and the fire chief said, well, that would have really helped during the Northridge earthquake when one of their main reservoirs actually cracked and sprung a leak. They were lucky that they were able to get the water out before it became an issue. But the new reservoir in its place now is bomb proof. But from their point of view, this would have been very helpful to just be able to set up a network and send images and have the people back at Central and the engineers have an additional look at what the situation is at any particular site. Monterey Park is planning to put up a mesh network within itself because they do have a lot of sites available. So we'll see um, how that works out. Now they're in the process of getting all the permissions and so on. And it's once this is up and running, they'll be probably the most networked city in terms of Arden Mesh in the country. So it's very great work. Um, we already talked about the speed. We don't have to rehash that. One of the things that we came away with in this particular exercise was for voice, especially tactical communications, we used the two meter um, repeater they had up there, worked absolutely beautifully. PTT makes life a lot easier. But for data, Collecting and transmitting was really great to have all the data collected at the park site and then transmitted quickly to the EOC. That made the decision finding a lot faster and it gave the EOC a lot of information. It didn't tie up any channels because if, they had, if the certs had to call all of this in over voice, it would have taken a longer time and it would have tied up these channels a lot longer. But I'd like to leave you at this point with a thought by Dwight D. Eisenhower that plans are worthless, but planning is everything. One of the great lessons that we've learned about doing a lot of deployments is we can plan all we want, but it always comes different. And if you have a lot of trained and skilled operators who enjoy deploying and solving problems, you actually can do a whole lot of good in this world. So um, we strongly recommend plan for the worst, but things don't work out in a complex environment, then at least you understand what you can work with and you adapt and you overcome. And I hope that has given you a bit of an overview over how we use Mesh in Aries LAX. And with that, um, I'm happy to stop this and we can do questions and answers. Oh, sorry, my name is Brian, I guess, from, and I work with Board Water Supply. Um, suppose we wanted, we needed to set up like an ad hoc network. Mm -hmm. how, how heavy is, is one of the, is the gear for one of those? To, I mean, how heavy is the gear required to set up one of those nodes? Suppose we couldn't drive out to where we needed to place it. Could, I mean, is it going to be kind of a burden to carry one of those things? No, I mean, they weigh between, anywhere between 300 and 700 grams. Okay. okay. Not heavy. In fact, one of our one of our guys, the Spartan races, he actually took three notes in his backpack and ran them up a hill, um, two thousand feet, just to connect, and did a connection that way. So it's really light. Um, if you want me to, I can grab one of um, one of uh, the equipment and just show you. Um. So this is a sixteen dB, relatively small, but I mean high power um, device. But you can see this weighs nothing. Oh, okay, okay. And that'll go, that'll go easily 15, 16 miles. Oh, wow. Interesting. Okay, thank you. What about the power consumption? Um, three, uh, the, they draw 300 milliamps on full power. So a, a, a small, essentially, we put them up with nine amp hour batteries, 12 amp hour batteries, if those are connected to a solar panel, these will run until the equipment fails. And since there are no moving parts, it'll be a long time. And by the way, this is all outdoor rated equipment, except for this one. This one's indoor only. But this stuff is stuff you can mount on a site. And those are directional antennas? Yes, this is a directional antenna. Um, the omnidirectionals, usually you buy the antenna separately. 
how do you align the uh, antennas over two points separated by a big distance? Um, there are actually two main ways, well, three main ways of doing that, that we've used. One, you can go really old school and use mirrors because you can see the mirror, you can point it in that direction. Two, GPS works really well. We, use, we like to use that app called What Three Words. It gives you a pre precise nine foot by nine foot or three meter by three meter um, square that you can point it towards. And they built in an audio, an audio, um, how should we call that? A tone. And as you point it, it actually gets higher in pitch, the better the signal gets. So as you turn this, your computer will tell you, oh, now you got it, now you're losing it, get back that direction. So that has worked really well for us as well. I've actually used that uh, on Kauai. This is Jim, NH6HI. I'm over here on Oahu today. Uh, we actually use that to find off of the passive reflector. I, I have a, a microtick uh, hap, uh, or not, uh, yeah, anyways, the uh, base box five with an Omni on it on my van, and I drove around Lihui and actually had the, the thing going in the back of my van, and I'm just driving around, I'm not looking, just listening for tone, so that's yep. how I found where the signal ended up. Do you have any passive uh, reflectors in LA area? No. There's one I know of in um, in Santa Clarita, but I don't know whether they've gotten permission to actually use that. There used to be an old um, Verizon site, and they were mm -hmm. using that to connect, um, because that, technically this is where this equipment comes in. This is all commercial equipment, if you think about it. Um, they were using they were using the reflector as long as a lot of microwave equipment to connect their different repeater sites and cell sites. In fact, in Florida, what they've done, because the Department of Transportation has really gotten into it, they are using microwave. I don't, I'm not sure whether they use Arden. I doubt they use Arden for this, but they use microwave connections for connecting repeater sites all along the major interstates, I-95 and so on. And so you can key up your radio in Key West and you can be heard all the way in Tallahassee because they have these microwave links. Oliver, we recently connected one uh, hospital down on the Big Island to HPA High School. Uh, and it goes through a, a private uh, ubiquity link it goes through seven hops. And when we tested out the ping time, it was enormous. In fact, it, to the point where it wasn't really usable. How, how about that? It's not modern mesh and it, it's something uh, uh, proprietary that's built down there. How does that problem uh, come up in Arden mesh networks? Well, I mean, latency is always an issue with all IP networks. Um, one of the things that we found is on voice, it tends to not make a big difference uh, because voice is so narrow. And on email, it makes zero difference because the email just waits until all the packets are assembled. What it makes a big difference is in video. And then the question is, how important is video to you? I mean, again, for us as a hospital driven group, video is kind of nice to have, but by and large, we wouldn't that wouldn't be our first response. I mean, what do we want to do? Show people the mayhem? N not really. Not really what we're what, what we want to do. Um, for fire departments, it might be different. But what we found is what they like is the ability to send pictures. Having a high quality photograph can tell them a lot more about what's going on in that particular situation. So, yes, I mean latency is always an issue, and that may be a problem within the network. If you are in a deployment, usually the way this works is you talk to the other people on your handheld or on your repeater site or, and you try to figure out what, what's going on. But anything that happens to regular networks, you will encounter with Arden. In a lot of ways, it's more robust because there are fewer things that can go wrong, but things can go wrong. Yeah, I, got a, I got a technical one. So one of my buddies, he's, a, he's also a ham. He's not here today, I'm sure he would have loved to join. But he's actually trying out 
I guess you call it the mesh network or iron, iron network. He has uh, one of the routers, not ones you listed, um, but I'm kind of curious, like on the back end side, you're dealing with IPs and you're dealing with a bunch of other different people trying to jump into the same network. How do you coordinate and manage the IP addressing? Because they all gotta be statically assigned, right? I'm assuming well, so. When you flash a node, the IP address of the node is set and it does act as a DHCP server. So you can hook up to, I think, 20, was it 23 now? No, 26 now is the limit um, of other nodes. So it, is, it has a built-in DHCP server. The way they've done this, they've built an algorithm into the flashing process that takes the MAC address, the hardware address, and a combination of that and I think your call sign and then generates a unique IP address. I think they've only ever had one issue where there was one duplicate. Other than that, it's pretty robust. Oh, okay. Yeah. But think about it as a local area network. It, the beauty of this is, and why we like it, is you can expand this network depending on how you need it and you can contract it when you don't need it anymore simply because you're taking nodes offline you don't have that problem that you need to hop from one network to another network. Um, if I recall correctly, there are about 16 million addresses available. So there'll be a lot of addresses for quite a while. And the nice thing is, if let's say there's a, you have a network, a local network in, in your room right now, and one of you has a tunnel through the internet, to SoCal, we could still communicate through that internet-based tunnel and you'd see everything that I see. Obviously, your um, traffic would be slower because you have to jump through the internet, but by and large, you could connect to all the Winlink gateways, to all the voice over IP, the cameras, and all of that. So that I think the furthest station is in New Zealand using the internet. Where is the DHPC uh, uh, server located, the function? in that yeah it's on it's every one of these has dhcp um capabilities so what we do let me let me grab one of the small ones real quick yeah the dhcp is for the devices connecting to it like your laptop your ip cameras and all of that but the statically assign off of your mac address the, the one that's algorithmly assigned that's for our point-to-point -point node communication right absolutely so Every node has a unique IP address that you can find it on the mesh network. That won't change. What might change in your DHCP is the assignment that the node makes for your computers, et cetera. So yes. Where does, the, where, where does that get, or the node get its IP address? Um, the node gets the IP address during the flashing process through a combination of the MAC address, which tends to be unique, and your call sign usually. So they put that in an algorithm and assign that IP address. And so how resilient are this to a power reset, a power reboot? Let me tell you, when you, when you do this a lot, you reboot them a lot. The only thing they don't like is they're, they're going to be, um, they're going to, they don't like water. So the worst thing that can happen is that you short it out and then you just have to enter your call sign again and you will get the same IP address as you did before. So that has happened to us. But every time, for instance, you change the channel or the bandwidth, you do have to restart the, the system so it actually takes it. So yes, it's, it's very resilient in terms of it keeps the same IP address independent on what channel or bandwidth combination you choose. And, and so it already knows who it's talking to, right? So if you had configured a node in the device and you reboot it, it's gonna try to reconnect back again. Yeah, if you, if you haven't moved it. The beauty of this is over, let's say, competing architectures like Hamnet, what they use in Europe. In Europe, you have to tell the, the system what it connects to. So essentially, you create a whitelist. And you're saying, you're connecting to this. Here, all you have to set is the channel and the bandwidth. And it'll look around and say, oh, these are all the stations that are on the same channel, on the same bandwidth, and I'll connect to them. It's a really... The idea behind Arden is genius because they want to take the complexity out of it. That's why you can deploy these relatively quickly. When we tested them this year at Baker to Vegas, the whole testing 
of the network took less than 20 minutes. It took us an hour because we actually had to drive to and from the sites and walk them up there. But by and large, once the channel and the bandwidth are agreed upon, everybody can connect to everybody else. So, so Aaron, what is this R R E E N? Arden. Arden. Yeah. Arden is different from the handnet. It's different, completely different software. Yes. So handnet is the one that works on the links is WRT fifty fours. Is that the one? Oh, oh no. originally, originally the Arden was built on on top of that kind of architecture because both of them came out of Open WRT, but right. the the old WRT um, fifty four and there was an office that I worked in a long time, about like twenty years ago. Uh, that, yeah. that was yeah, that was cutting edge technology. But one of the things that you want to <clears throat> that has happened in the last year or so is you do want to go with higher memory devices, 64 megabytes and, and larger RAMs, and you want to go with MIMO devices, multiple in, multiple out, and want to avoid um, single in, single out or CISO devices. That's just good networking because most of these packages are getting larger and larger. One of the nice thing about Microtex is they're all 64 megabyte or larger devices, so they're relatively easy to flash and very robust. Um, with Ubiquiti, if you buy them on eBay, sometimes you get an XM version, and that's a 32. They still work, but they generally, and you see that on the website now, they generally don't recommend um, using that because it makes life a lot more difficult. Um, again, these are all, this is just a little stick. This is a two gigahertz one once this is flashed. And so they're great if you have a single computer and you just assign one extra IP address to that. Um, just to show you what, how mine are configured, this one in my case is usually just one IP address. This I usually leave with five because you can put a simple switch on it and it'll get you um, five addresses. And this one is the maximum is 26 because here you've, I've got the five gigahertz part 15. So what we actually have done with these, we've put them up in EOCs and had people connect to them with their own phones. And then showed them how easy it was to make a phone call through that. So using things like Linphone and so on, where you can turn off the encryption. And that brings 26 people in a room online. So you can take one of these, pop it into the room where you're at, put this outside of the window, and again, we've done this in EOCs and everybody in your room right now could connect to one of these and then be connected to the entire mesh um, via DTD through that. So you don't need a lot of equipment to do a whole lot of good. All right, I wanna thank you for taking the time to introduce this. Uh, we may be in contact with you again to get more information. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having us. We're always happy to, um, to, to talk to our friends in Hawaii and anything we can do to, to reach out and help each other, we're all for.